So I'm Kathleen Mannheimer from Career Services, and it's with great pleasure tonight that we bring Maisha Walker as our Imagine speaker for fall. Um, this Imagine program was conceived about four years ago as a way for us to bring back alumni to talk about their own career journeys, their personal journeys. Um, gives them an opportunity to talk about how when they looked out upon graduation, they really weren't sure what, how their lives would unfold, both from a personal or professional basis. And so it really gives an opportunity for them to reflect, and more importantly, for all of you to benefit from their reflection, their advice, and their own personal stories um, that are often heartfelt and um, honest you know, about the choices that they made and the, um, the things that happened to them along the way. So with great pleasure, I'm going to have you talk a lot about your career. Um, she's currently president of Message Medium and columnist with Inc. Magazine, but has lots more to talk about in terms of her background and the paths that she took. So thank you, Thank Maisha. you. So uh, like I said, I, I think probably the easiest thing is for me to just give a very brief kind of background about what my career was and how I ended up where I am. Um, I have told this story many times, so hopefully it'll be quick and painless. Um, so basically when I, and it was funny, I was just talking to Kathleen about this before we started. When I was here as a senior, um, I do remember lots of my friends, which you guys are probably starting to see now, and maybe some of you are doing this, um, lots of my friends getting really dressed up and really stressed out and going, and you're laughing because you know exactly what I'm about to say, um, and going out to do all these interviews, and I had no idea what was going on. It was just this weird kind of, not exactly a time warp, but it was almost like another dimension that they were walking into, and I couldn't figure out what was going on. And so I stopped someone on the way to an interview, which was probably not the nicest thing for me to do at the time, but uh, and asked her, like, what is going on? What, where are all these people going? And she said, oh, we're going to interview for recruiting. And I said, well, recruiting for what? And she said, consulting and investment banking. And I was like, how is it possible that I have gotten through you know, 12 years at probably one of the best schools in the country, this was growing up and going to high school, four years at Princeton, and I have never heard of investment banking or consulting. I had no idea what she was talking about. So when I finally learned what these things were, um, I realized that this sort of amorphous world of business <laughs> was something that I was kind of interested in. I didn't really know what that meant. Obviously, it was way too late for me to go through the recruiting process. Um, and so when I graduated, I really had no idea what I was going to do. I grew up on Long Island, so I went back home and lived there for a little while. Um, and then I just went out and I looked in the newspaper, because in, oh right, back then, we had paper newspapers. <laughs> and there was one called the New York Times, which thankfully is one of the ones that's still in business. And on the front section of the Sunday New York Times, uh, there was a whole page of classified ads, like little boxes written with job opportunities on them. And so I went to that and I opened it up and I started looking through all these job opportunities um, and called a bunch of places that all turned out to be uh, agencies, recruiting agencies. And oddly enough, most of them were looking for secretaries. So I spent the first, at least, yeah, the first year of my career working as a secretary. Um, in, where was I working? It was a place called Newberger and Berman. It was a financial management company. They basically worked with uh, high net worth clients and managed their financial portfolios. Um, and I remember, and of course I'm gonna blank on his name. Do you guys remember the TV show? Maybe some of you, like you guys, <laughs> remember uh, the TV show, A Different World? Do you remember Kadeem Hardison? So I was really excited because that was one of their clients. It was this really famous guy from like a really old TV show. Um, and so he was one of their clients, and so that was very exciting for me. Um, so I worked there as a secretary for a while um, and took the opportunity really to learn more about banking and finance. Um, I studied for the Series 7, if anybody knows what that is. It's one of the financial um, licenses that you get to be able to trade, actually do trades. Um, and I studied, uh, let's see, I got a financial uh, planning, I took a couple of financial planning and accounting courses at NYU um, because I, I really just wanted to understand kind of this world of business. I wasn't even sure exactly what that meant. Um, so I spent about eight months working for Newberger and Berman and then I sort of got tired of uh, doing the secretarial work, which frankly, 
I don't know how many of you guys have tried to do that. I did it here in, in Princeton as well, and frankly, it was a lot easier when I did it here. Um, being a secretary is not easy. It is not easy. It, you, it's incredibly, especially in the finance world, it is incredibly detailed, and you have to be very good about learning how to manage somebody else's life, which is really a lot harder than learning how to manage your own, right? Um, and I just didn't really like it that much, frankly, so I kind of got out of that space. Um, and then, I got a job, oh, so to, to get my next job, um, I came to the Office of Career Services, actually. Um, and I knew that I had two interests. One was uh, I was interested in working in publishing. Um, and then, you know, I think that was actually it at the time. I was only interested in working in publishing. And so back then, again, they had a database of all these alumni who had offered to give you, do you remember this? You're nodding, yeah. So they had a database, and the database still exists, it's just in a different format now, but there was a database of alumni who were willing to either give you advice, just general advice, um, allow you to shadow them for a couple of weeks, like in their job. Um, they were also willing to help you find a job or they might have a job to actually give you, right? These were all the things that you could select. And you could indicate one or two cities that you were interested in, and then you were able to give um, a couple of topic areas, I think maybe three to five topic areas. So I sent in all my information. I was interested in publishing. Mainly I wanted to be in New York. Um, I think my second choice was DC. And they sent me back in the mail <laughs> this thick stack of paper with a list of all of the alumni in New York and DC who worked in publishing with their phone number and their mailing address because nobody used email at the time. Um, and I went through the list and sort of checked off the people that looked kind of interesting or worked at companies that looked cool. And I contacted about 10 people. Um, nine of them wrote me back and all of them actually invited me out. Most of them invited me out to lunch. They actually sat down with me, bought me lunch, grilled me, asked me all sorts of questions about what I was interested in and what I had done. Um, I was telling Kathleen earlier, one of them even got me an interview at Rolling Stone magazine, which just totally blew me. I didn't get the job, but <laughs> I just was amazed that this person got me an interview just like that at Rolling Stone. So um, I am going to put in a plug right now for the Career Services uh, Office and their database. You know, one of the things that I certainly have not done enough of and am remedying now um, is just getting out and talking to people, just like you guys are, I guess, kind of doing now. Uh, even if you don't know what it is that you want, if you have some idea of what your interests are, just getting out and asking people questions. You know, what do you do for a living? And what do you hate about it? And what do you love about it? And how did you get there? And um, how did you find the job that you have? And how did you craft whatever it is that you're doing in your job right now? I think it's incredibly important uh, to just find out from people who are doing what you might be interested in doing, what they had, what they wish they had known when they were in your shoes. Um, because there are certainly lots of things that I wish that I had known. And if I just talked to people and asked more questions, like I did that one time, uh, I think I would have saved myself a lot of headache. <laughs> so, um, so that was an amazing experience. I ended up uh, taking a job. I did get a job in publishing, uh, working for a company called K3 Magazines which no longer exists. They were bought out, and then that company was bought out, and then that company was bought out. I don't even know who owns them now and what they're called. But they owned um, Seventeen Magazine, which you guys, have, at least all the girls, have heard of. Um, they also owned uh, New York Magazine, which most people who are in New York, right, you guys have heard of that one. Um, and I actually worked on the circulation side, which interestingly enough, um, one of the people that I, that I connected with from the careers database warned me about. They were like, no matter what you do, do not get stuck in the circulation department. So of course, that's where I ended up getting a job. Um, I guess because nobody else wanted it, but I was happy. Uh, this was, basically our job was to um, get new subscribers for the magazine. So we did all of the, uh, so when you have, when you own, how many here actually get print magazines in the mail? Okay. All right, so like half the room. Um, so when you uh, subscribe to a magazine, you get those letters in the mail to remind you to renew the subscription or to encourage you to subscribe for longer 
or if you subscribe through like Publishers Clearinghouse and you didn't pay your bill yet, you get a you know letter in the mail to say, okay, you subscribed and we've given you six issues and now you need to pay us. That was me. <laughs> I was responsible for writing those letters. Um, we would hire designers to like design. Believe it or not, people design those. They would look like boring like office mail. People design those, and it is a science to try to figure out how to design these renewal and subscription letters to get more pe the most people possible to renew these magazines. And then we also um, designed, so you know when you're opening a magazine and you're reading it and those little cards fall out on the floor? We did those too. <laughs> Everybody loved us. Those were the most fun because they were usually really colorful and creative. And again, there was a whole science to figuring out how to design those things in order to get the most people to subscribe. There's all sorts of tracking information, like someone could come to your house and find your renewal letter and figure out exactly who you are. There's all sorts of tracking data all over that stuff. So um, that was my sort of introduction to marketing, basically, in the direct marketing space. Um, it was also, and this turned out to be uh, really sort of prophetic, it was also my introduction to spreadsheets. So uh, back then, we didn't have Excel, we had Lotus. <laughs> I don't know if anyone has even heard of Lotus, but it was a precursor to Excel. Um, it was the, the spreadsheet software that everybody used. Um, and so I got introduced to spreadsheets and data and data manipulation, and I loved it. It was so exciting and thrilling. So I would go in and I, we had these huge spreadsheets that we would use to keep track of all of the um, stationary. So for every letter that got sent out, every envelope that letter was going into, every card, all of them, basically we had to order all this stock for all of those things to make sure we had enough to send out. So when the renewal and subscription dates came up, we had enough stock ready to send all the letters out. Um, eventually I totally screwed up <laughs> and I had created all of it. I got so excited about these spreadsheets. I created all these amazing formulas so we could plug things in and plug in dates and like all the stock numbers would automatically update. It was really creative and innovative but it was totally broken and so I remember there was this one time there was a renewal letter that was supposed to go out and we got a call from the printing house saying you know we've run out of stock for this letter, and there's like for like three of them, <laughs> we can't send them out on time because we don't have enough stock. So it was uh, definitely <laughs> a very exciting and interesting experience. But at the time, I really just did not understand what I like to say that I learned later: uh, just the value of perfection, the value of making sure that everything you do, all the I's are dotted, all the T's are crossed and how much it was actually worth spending all the extra time to make sure that those things happened. Um, I think when you're in school, everything is, so, I mean, unless you're maybe in one of the sciences where you're doing a lot of data manipulation or calculation, everything is sort of wishy-washy. And I was a French major, you know? There was no real right or wrong in that department. You know, you, I wrote a lot of essays and I read a lot of books and, you know, I spoke French all the time, but there was no need for things to be really perfect. There was always five different ways that you could say the same thing. And so um, that uh, was actually my, first and only, thankfully, experience at getting fired <laughs> for that horrendous mistake. Yeah, it was, well, it was more than that, to, if I'm going to be fair. I had a, a crazy boss, but that's a whole other conversation. Um, so I got fired from that job, and that was very humbling. Um, again, also to be fair, um, even though I really found the work fascinating and some of the other people I worked with, I did kind of have a crazy boss. Um, and I really didn't like her very much because she was kind of crazy um, and she made my life a little miserable. So I had already planned on leaving, um, but they fired me before I quit. So, so uh, I had this grand plan that I was going to leave this company. I had it worked out for about, uh, I was going to be there for another three months um, and I was going to save all this money. Um, and then I was going to take a cross country train trip. And I had all these friends in different parts of the country that I was going to go visit. And I thought, this is going to be a great opportunity. It'll be summer. I can go visit my friends and do this very sort of romantic train trip through, you know, middle America. Um, and so I got fired, <laughs> which sort of threw rent in the plans. But the odd thing that ended up working out beautifully was that um, I also was getting paid incredibly little for this job. So I ended up uh, going back to those agencies that I had first connected with when I graduated um, and getting temp jobs. So this is sort of moving me into the next phase of my career. 
Um, and so I, I went to these temp jobs, and they give you all these crazy exams, like, all right, we're going to sit you down at a computer, and you're going to uh, show us how much you know about Excel. And so there were these canned tests they would give you on the computer to see how much you knew what your Excel skills were and how advanced they were. But what they didn't realize, I guess this is like my Princeton education coming in, but they didn't realize is that they let you take the test for as long as you wanted, and you could take it repeatedly. Right, you guys are like figuring this out in your head now. So of course, I took the test like five times and I aced it because I'd taken it five times and it was all the same questions. And so they'd, you know, I'd hand in the test and they'd be like, we've never seen anybody with Excel skills like yours. We've never seen anybody with word, you know, word processing skills like yours. And they'd be like, yeah, okay, whatever. So they'd send me on these jobs, um, these temp jobs. And I ended up getting placed at uh, Morgan Stanley, which you guys have all heard of. Um, an investment banking company, sort of came full circle, right? Um, to all those friends of mine who were doing recruiting uh, at the investment banks. So I got placed at Morgan Stanley, um, and I would bounce around, obviously. I basically would just replace, and I had these secretarial skills too. So I would just replace secretaries when they went out on vacation or on not so much maternity leave. I think the longest temp job I had was maybe a week, uh, maybe two weeks. But it was, um, Kind of funny because I would walk in and I'd have my little power suit on, right? I'd walk into my tent job. And I had uh, a copy, I'd always have a copy of The Economist, which was a habit I picked up here in economics <laughs> class. So I had my little power suit and my copy of The Economist, which I would sit there and read because there was like nothing to do at these temp jobs. And I also had a copy of my uh, GMAT study book because I was studying for, uh, to get into business school. And there were actually a couple of times where something would cross my desk and they were like, oh, we need to get this translated into French. It was completely bizarre, almost like divine intervention. And so I'd go and I'd like translate stuff for these folks into French and they'd sort of, and this was classic, I think I had maybe 10 of these assignments and it was like clockwork, sort of how this would play out. So I'd walk in with all this crazy stuff and do all these weird things. And at some point, the MD, because I was always working for MDs, which if you know anything about investment banking, they're sort of the top of the food chain. Um, they'd walk in and they'd sort of look, they'd look at me for a second after like a day or two and they'd be like, what do you do when you're not here? <laughs> where, where are you coming from and like wh why are you here? And so they'd sort of pull me into their office and sit me down and I'd kind of tell them my whole story. Inevitably, they would always say, you know what? We need to find you a job here because this is weird. Like you shouldn't be doing what you're doing. Um, Every time, it was, it was, you know, in a way, oddly kind of satisfying. You know, it sort of boosts your ego when somebody tells you something like that. But inevitably, again, nothing would happen. They'd sort of have this whole conversation with me, and they'd say, oh, we're going to connect you with this person and that person. I knew nothing about networking. I knew nothing about building relationships or the fact that all these MDs were kind of excited about me for five minutes could have actually led to something um, until the last temp job that I got when they actually hired me they actually hired me in their own department as an analyst. Um, and so I ended up working at Morgan Stanley as an analyst for three years, uh, an analyst and then an associate. Um, one thing I did forget to mention is before the Morgan Stanley job, um, this was in 1996, when the internet, I guess, was just starting to become an industry, um, I worked at an internet startup, basically, for about three months. Um, I didn't get paid. Actually, I was living on Long Island at the time, which is where I grew up. Um, and so they paid for my, I stood up for myself and I said, you know what, if you're not going to pay me, you at least have to buy my train ticket so that I can get here. So they, they paid for my Long Island Railroad train ticket. That was it. Um, and that's why at the same time, I ended up temping and working at Morgan Stanley. So I actually have some money. Um, and so I studied all this stuff about the internet. I worked with them for a while, did website building, um, learned all about TCP IP and all these crazy protocols and HTTP and all that stuff. Um, then left and worked for finance, in finance for three years. Um, and if you know anything about finance, generally the way that industry works is you work for a couple of years and then usually you switch groups. You find a group uh, that you want to stay in and try to sort of raise, rise through the ranks. Um, but after three years of working in this group, which is technically uh, in the industry, a back office group. We weren't front office. We weren't doing actual investment banking. We weren't doing retail sales. We were really responsible for um, doing a variety of reporting that actually went to senior management and the board of directors about the health of Morgan Stanley as a company. So all of that training that I had in spreadsheets and Lotus came back 
um, for me to be able to use working at Morgan Stanley. And actually, it was interesting because uh, the person who hired me told me that it was only that one job that actually convinced him to hire me because I had that Excel experience, because since, this was terrible, I don't know if I should tell you this, but he was like, you know, you were a French major. I had no idea if you would be able to handle the math involved and this, like the spreadsheet and number crunching, um, which I found really insulting. Just because I'm a French major doesn't mean I can't count. So anyway, he looked and saw that I had this uh, spreadsheet experience at my previous job, um, and that was the sort of tipping point for me in getting the job in the first place. So three years went by, um, the internet industry continued to evolve and become bigger and more involved. Um, and so I just couldn't, at that time, see myself doing my boss's job or her boss's job or her boss's job. Um, I was sort of interested in getting into um, the equity research side, but there was a strange kind of dichotomy between the two sides of the business. Equity research was front office. And so somehow it was really difficult for people to move from being back office to being front office. I have no idea why. Uh, but because of that friction, I said, you know what, I'm just, I'm not interested in trying to figure all of this crazy stuff out. I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur. Um, I love programming. I love working with computers. I have all this experience now. Uh, more than most people in working with websites and the internet. I've been, incidentally, I started programming when I was like nine. So I had this long sort of love of computers and technology for, for many years at that point. So I said, you know what, I, and, and while I was at Morgan Stanley, and this is sort of an interesting thing, is there anybody here who's actually thinking of being an entrepreneur? I know you're thinking about it. You are, you are too. Um, I had so much more time <laughs> when I was working at Morgan Stanley than I ever did as an entrepreneur. I mean, things are sort of starting to shift now after being an entrepreneur for 15 years, but in the beginning, it was insane. I worked constantly when I started my own business. Um, and so while I was at Morgan Stanley is when I learned how to program in Perl, which nobody uses anymore, but it was the language that most of the first interactive websites were built on. Now everybody uses PHP and other technologies, but Perl is where it really all started. Um, and so while I was at Morgan, I'm like sitting, going home and reading through Perl textbooks and building out entire websites. I built like a, a social network for this volunteer group that we had started from Princeton alumni in New York. Um, so I did all this programming and then decided, you know, I'm going to leave Morgan Stanley now. This is a great opportunity. I'd made tons of money. <laughs> That's one good thing that investment banking is really great for. I'd made lots of money and banked it all. I'm a big saver. So I said, I'm just going to go out and try to get a job as a Perl programmer, essentially, because there were companies like the New York Times who didn't have websites or didn't have you know, database-driven websites. Um, and I knew MySQL um, as well as Perl, and so I decided I was going to go out and try to get a job and learn from some real programmers, because I, I was sure that there were tons of things I didn't know, which was very true. Um, and so I left. And I ended up actually working with a couple of Princeton people who ran their own, uh, again, investment management business. And they were looking for someone who could really help them navigate the world of the internet and understand how they could use the technology to extend their business. So how could we start new businesses or subsets of our business or add new services and leverage the web and leverage the internet to do it? And what was feasible? How much was it going to cost? What kind of resources did we need? And so I ended up getting these consulting clients, actually, having nothing to do with programming. Um, but I realized that, you know, there is somewhat of a stereotype, which I think thankfully is changing, uh, that programmers are really not very good at doing much besides programming, at least in the business world. So you know, being able to talk to people, um, being able to explain what it is that they're doing, and why something takes longer than something else. Um, and I had those skills. I had a marketing background from working in the publishing industry. I had a finance and business and reporting background from working at Morgan Stanley and having to present things. But then I also had this programming background. And so that all kind of came together and is how I started going out and doing consulting in the internet space. Um, so I had my first client before I even left Morgan Stanley. I mean, that was really kind of luck remarkable luck um, and just being in the right place at the right time. I'm sure that's a huge part of it. Um, and so I went out and left Morgan uh, with some cash in the bank and started my business. That was in 99. Um, about six years later, and then I, I freelanced for a while, essentially as a consultant. 
Um, I worked on a couple of really amazing projects, one of which was for Save the Children, where we built out this whole, um, so before social networks, there was this concept called an online community. And it was this interesting concept of um, a network of, sort of like a social network plus a, a magazine combined in one. So there was an editorial department and then there was a community department and they were relatively separate. And the community folks, which is what I did, were responsible for building all of the people, the, the network of people who would come to the site, read the content, use the content to get a sense of the editorial style and the feeling of the site, and then in a, interact with all the other community members on the site. So they'd have bulletin boards, um, they had online profiles, but a lot of the content was driven by the editorial side. Um, for the most part, that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, things have really moved a lot more towards separating those two things. So you have online publications that basically just have blog uh, discussion boards underneath them, right? That's the extent of what you see in the online community space. And then you just have pure social networks like Facebook or LinkedIn, where the folks at Facebook aren't creating any content, right? They're just enabling, creating ways to enable their community members to create all the content, which is a lot cheaper. So now there's a total separation in those two things, but at the time they were very much connected. And so I ran uh, two projects, one for Save the Children and one for this company called Delia's. Um, where we built out these incredible online communities. Are you familiar with Delia's? You are, okay. <laughs> you, most people don't know it. It's a, it's a catalog. It's basically the biggest catalog for girls in the, the world, I think. Um, so we, we created these online communities for teens, basically people from 13 to 25. Um, and that was wonderfully successful and a great experience. And it really gave me an education in how to leverage this new technology um, to encourage people to engage with each other. So how do you actually um, enable this sort of cold, hard digital interface to be a tool that people would feel comfortable connecting with in very private and personal ways, uh, connecting with other complete strangers who they know absolutely nothing about except what they you know, say in their profile. Um, so that was an incredible experience. Just, we experimented a lot and tried out lots of tools and techniques and created all these widgets. I um, mean, did some amazing things to build these online communities, which were, which were very successful. Um, after that, the sort of bottom fell out of the online community industry. Uh, they didn't fit, figure out how to monetize it at the time. Um, and then right at the beginning of the dot-com bust, when it was just starting to fall apart, um, they just ran out of funding. They ran out of funding before they had figured out how to actually monetize these communities. Um, so there were no, no new opportunities in that space that at least I was particularly interested in. But I decided to figure out, you know, based on all of this information I gained about working with teens to help them figure out um, how to engage online and how to get them excited and get them interacting, um, what, was it, what was another group that I could feel really passionate about helping to do that for? Um, and that's how I ended up working with small businesses. Um, which I started doing uh, in, about six years ago. Um, that too has evolved a lot. When I first started working with small businesses, of course there weren't really, you know, Facebook didn't really exist, at least not in the way it does now. Um, it, things were a lot simpler then. It was basically just websites, right? You built a website and maybe you sent out a few emails <laughs> to try to get people to the website. Um, and so things were a lot simpler, but I had this passion for trying to deliver um, the kind of content that a small business owner really needed in order to understand uh, what, what j the job they had ahead of them in terms of creating this presence online. And I wanted to do it you know, at these ridiculous price points. Like I wanted to build websites for $500, um, which you know, if you hear that number, maybe it sounds like a lot or maybe it sounds really reasonable, um, but frankly, there was nobody else willing to <laughs> work for that little money. I was the only one willing to do it for that little money. And so I went through this long process of realizing that, you know, the passion I had for helping people um, was just not necessarily equivalent to the work that I actually wanted to do. I wanted to create these amazing online experiences and do all kinds of great things with internet marketing. And the target audience that I had chosen to work with just wasn't there. 
right? Their businesses weren't evolved enough yet for them to be doing these complex things that I wanted to be able to help them do. So there was just a natural disconnect um, in the, the two things that I was trying to accomplish. So my business really started then to shift to where it is now, which is essentially there's an education side to my business, and then there's an actual consulting and implementation side to the business. So on the education side, that's where the Inc. Magazine column came from. Um, I wrote a book a few years ago that I'm planning to update now. Um, I speak a lot. I've spoken at you know more than 400 events in my career. Um, so I've taught a lot of entrepreneurs as well as marketing executives how to use these tools and technologies. Um, and that I can do you know, very cost effectively from the business owner's perspective. And then there's a whole other side, which is the actual consulting work where we charge you know, a lot more <laughs> than we used to to actually do the implementation. So to design and build a website for someone or to create a social marketing campaign. Um, so that basically is my story um, in terms of kind of where I started and how I ended up where I am now. Um, the one thing that I will say is there are, so I talked a little bit about um, taking the opportunity to talk to as many people as you possibly can. I think the biggest, one of the biggest lessons that I've learned is it is so easy as a, an entrepreneur or even just as a professional in, in any career um, to sort of feel like you really are responsible for doing everything yourself. That, you know, especially going to a school like this, I think you have certain expectations of yourself, as well as other people having certain expectations of you. Um, and people sort of, and sometimes we assume that we're supposed to know everything that we need in order to get to the next phase of our careers or get to the next phase of our lives. And I just think that is a huge mistake. It is a complete myth. Um, and the most successful people, and I, the other problem I think is that the media really perpetuates that myth, right? We see a lot of um, articles and spotlights on people that really try to present these amazingly successful people as kind of monolithic, people who sort of you know, pulled themselves up by their bootstraps and you know, did all these things. And when you dig a little deeper, you find out that you know, they were you know, one terrible example. I hate to use this example because this isn't exactly what I'm talking about, but you know, they were somebody's son, right? Like Donald Trump is a great example. People found out that, oh, it wasn't just Donald creating all this stuff. His dad was like a multi-millionaire real estate executive, right? So um, there are so many examples like that. Um, and even if you don't take necessarily celebrities, you find that the people who really did start from nothing didn't just walk through the world and create all this stuff out of nowhere. They had a lot of help. They had a lot of mentors. They had a lot of courage and guts to go out and talk to people who they had no idea whether those people were going to respond or talk to them back or give them good advice or bad advice. But they went out and they took the chance of putting themselves out there and asking for help um, and at every opportunity that they could, you know, bouncing ideas off of someone, finding the people who you think have done it before, and maybe you don't just go to one person, maybe you go to 15, and then three out of those 15 people are gonna end up being like your, your most incredible advice givers throughout the length of your career, or maybe just for a year. But definitely one of the things that I learned, you know, especially growing up uh, where I was the first person in my family to go to college, I'm the first person in my family to have a quote unquote sort of white collar job. You know, my family members were great, but they just had no, they had no resources to give me in terms of the path that I was destined sort of to lead. So, and no one in my family, not, not my immediate family, not my extended family, there was nobody. So I really, it took me a long time to figure out that what I really needed to do was go out and ask people for help and ask for advice, um, even around the things that I didn't even know I didn't know, right? Um, and I think that's, if I could, if I had one lesson to sort of give to everybody is you really do have to have the courage um, to realize that you need help and that you don't even necessarily know what kind of help you actually need. You just have to go out there and find people who you admire and respect and trust them uh, to give you some good advice. And obviously you're, gonna, you're, you're not gonna go blindly into accepting people's advice, but um, really just try to talk to as many people as possible. And if, you, if you're an entrepreneur and you've got some amazing idea, one of the worst things you could do is try to sh hide it, is try to hide that idea. Um, you've got to just have confidence that you have the ability to execute on that idea better than anybody else can. 
So, but you've got to get out and you've got to talk about your idea because it's the only way you're going to get the resources and the help you need. I tell my students a lot when I teach classes, um, entrepreneurs do not, there, there's no possible way unless you've got a big sort of bank account or someone funding you, there is no possible way that you can afford all of the help that you need to get your business to the next level. He's nodding, yeah. <laughs> there's no way, it's not possible. The resources don't exist and you can't afford it. You have to go out and find those people who are gonna be willing to support you for free because they like you, because you've got a relationship with them, because they like your idea. And the only way you can do that is by sharing with people what it is, you know, what is your big idea? What is it that you're excited about that you wanna get the world excited about? Um, so just getting out and sharing and talking to people um, would be the one thing that I kind like, of wish that people had told me because with that, right, the doors are open for you to learn everything else that you need to learn from those people that, that actually end up helping you. So I talked a lot more than I thought I was capable of. Um, so that's pretty much it. I don't know if anybody has any questions. I know I didn't talk that much about social media. Um, I can say on that note, from a social media perspective, oh yeah, so I have a great story for you. Um, so about three or four years ago, uh, so I work in, obviously I do a lot of social media, that's part of the, the consulting work that I do. Um, and about three or four years ago, I wanted to, uh, I had piloted out these courses that I was teaching and they're basically, we're gonna relaunch them next year. But I was teaching these courses that were, you know, small, intimate classes um, at sort of a luxury price point, um, where we would sit down with people and talk to them about. I would sit down and talk to people about social media, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, analytics. I'm um, in an intimate setting for about 20 to 30 people, and I piloted these classes. And they were really successful, but they were a little hit or miss. Like I'd have one class that would sell out, same topic. <laughs> I'd have one class that would sell out on another class where there'd be like five people. And this was really discouraging. As you can imagine, you're sort of like, I'm a marketing person. Why am I getting classes that have five people in them? And then having a class with the same topic that have 20. Like things should be a lot more predictable than that, right? Um, and so I went to one of my mentors <laughs> who has actually gone through this experience and taught classes, um, who said to me, it's just the nature of the beast. When you start doing these things, that's just how it's gonna happen. And don't be upset about it and don't give up. Like you just have to understand that I went through those kinds of ups and downs myself. And so then I started thinking about um, the numbers of it, just the, the analytics of it, um, and figuring out the, the, the statistics of it and realizing that I had a really small database. This is one of the things that came up during my conversation with my mentor. I had a really small database of people to, to reach out to. I think at the time I had maybe 1,500 or 2,000 people um, and so I asked him, you know, how many people do you think I should have in my database? Because so much of marketing is just a numbers game at a certain point, right? How many people do you think I should have in my database if I want to consistently have these classes sell out and be full? Um, and I kind of had an idea in my head from some of the research I had done, but the number he gave me was 10,000 people. That if you want to have a class, a full class of 20 to 30 people, the number that you want to have in your database to hit that is about 10,000. And as I talked to other people, that number kept popping up. So about three years ago, um, I sort of set myself this goal that I wanted to build 10,000 connections. It sounds kind of crazy, right? But again, I'm in marketing. <laughs> I, mean, I do social media for a living, so I figured, you know, it can't be that hard. Um, so there were, so I did it. I'm somewhere at like 15 or 17,000 now. Um, and it, uh, I was able to do that in about two years. Um, there were definitely one or two things that sort of tipped the scale for me. One was that during that time, um, I got the gig with Inc., which gave me a much broader uh, base and a, a much broader reach, bigger exposure, international exposure. Um, I got very excited when I sold my first book internationally to someone in Ireland. It was very cool. Um, so, so having that much broader platform really helped a lot. And obviously I had to think about how to leverage that platform to get those people in my, into my database. But at the time I was so focused on this 10,000 goal that I was doing all these crazy things that nobody else on Inc. was doing. So, you know, I signed up for a feed burner account so that people could go to my column and sign up right through my column uh, to get email updates whenever I posted a new blog post. Nobody else was doing that. I don't know why, but they weren't. And I was a little worried that Inc. was gonna like 
you know, slap me on the wrist, but they didn't. Um, I, I found this service called uh, this Tweet This service. So you could um, post a little icon at the top of your blog post and people just click on it and they can instantly tweet it out to all their friends. You know, I started adding a footer to all my blog posts that invited them to tweet it and I made it really easy. I wrote this little piece of code <laughs> they could just click on the link and instantly send it out and it would construct the tweet for them so they wouldn't even have to think about what to say. Um, I eventually um, ended up adding my LinkedIn link to all the bottom of all of my uh, blog posts. So I regularly get, you know, 100 people a month, 50 to 100 people a month contacting me to link, to invite me to connect with them on LinkedIn. So it wasn't just one place that I was trying to build all these connections. I figured I could leverage Twitter, I could leverage LinkedIn, I could leverage my own email database, I could leverage a whole separate email database for my ink column. Um, and between all of those, um, the numbers really started to build up. So Inc. was a great platform for that. Um, there are plenty of people on TigerNet, on the Princeton uh, lists, who know me from those, from those days, because when I would post something, and usually I posted things in series, so I'd have a series of three to five articles that I would write about a particular topic. Um, and so I didn't you know, push every single one of those out to the list, because I thought that would be kind of annoying. But when I had done the series, then I would actually craft you know, a discussion-oriented topic and send it out to the list with a link to all of the articles, or at least half of them, and then invite people to participate um, in a discussion about the content that I was writing about. And I guess I'm kind of lucky that I'm writing about sort of a sexy topic um, that in general people are eager to learn about. Um, so yeah, I, social media factored heavily into my ability to sort of build this huge network um, of people who now, three years later, I'm sort of ready to relaunch this series of classes um, which started the whole, I mean, so many other things have happened now <laughs> that sort of make the classes seem kind of small, but we're finally ready to go back and sort of relaunch the series of classes now. Um, and we are also, another major lesson I learned is not to try to, obviously I was talking about not doing things by yourself, getting people to give you advice. The other thing is really understanding the value of strategic partners. Um, that any company you see who's a you know, huge multi-billion dollar company did not get that way by trying to reach each individual customer one at a time. Again, there's just not enough money in the world to do that. So you, know, you think of really obvious examples like Best Buy and Geek Squad. Right? Geek Squad existed long before that relationship with Best Buy. But that is a perfect strategic partnership. And I don't know if eventually one of them bought out the other. I have no idea. I think maybe Best Buy bought Geek Squad or I, I don't know. But that is a perfect example of a company like Geek Squad saying, where are my customers? Who has them already? Who already has a relationship with all my customers? And how can I basically build a relationship with them so I never have to go out and sell again? And essentially, that's what they've done. So they're now located inside the Best Buy store. I mean, it, there couldn't be a better place for them to find customers. Um, so when we relaunched this series of classes, um, we now have a whole set of strategic partners who are going to do that with us, who each uh, have a network as big or bigger than mine. Um, so I will never have a class of three people again. <laughs> it was still fun, but it was a little, it was a little disheartening. So, <laughs> so hopefully that's yeah. helpful. Um, any other questions? I'm going to stand here until somebody asks me something. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so looking back at your undergraduate experience, mm -hmm. How helpful were the courses you took for all of this, and, and what would you do like, differently? Oh, gosh. OK, so that's a great question. So the question was, <laughs> looking back at my undergraduate experience, how helpful were the classes that I took um, for what I'm doing now, right? Uh, yeah. And then uh, is there anything I would do differently, right? Um, so I think one of the things that really for me, characterized my undergraduate experience was that I worked a lot and not on schoolwork. <laughs> I mean, I worked enough on schoolwork. I got decent grades. Um, but I remember going to some of my first interviews. Actually, it's even that Rolling Stone interview when people would ask me, so what were your extracurricular activities? What did you do at Princeton besides schoolwork? And I had to think. I really had to sit down and think about what the things were that I had done, because there was almost nothing. And I felt really bad about that for a while until I realized I had jobs <laughs> when I was on campus. Like, 
I didn't, you know, my parents couldn't afford to, to, to send me here. So I had to work to pay my tuition and pay for my books and pay for all my food and all that stuff. I mean, I got a huge amount of money in scholarships, but even the, the remainder, I mean, scholarships and loans, because at the time we still had loans, um, the remainder I had to pay for, right? So I had like three jobs <laughs> when I was on campus. I had no time for extracurricular activities. Um, my senior year, things changed a little bit um, because I was leaving and I just didn't need to work as much. And so I, um, I took an architecture class, which I loved. I had a blast and it helped me to realize I never wanted to be an architect. <laughs> um, I took, I did try every semester to take some sort of art related class. So I took an acting class. I took two sculpture classes, which I loved. Um, I took two photography classes. I mean, I really tried to make the most of the resources that were here um, to the extent that like I was thinking about that at the time. Um, so that was really amazing. I think, so, oh, the reason why I brought up the architecture class is because um, uh, the architecture class at the time, I don't know if it's still like this, there were a ton of supplies you had to buy for that class. And they were not cheap, at least at the time. And I, didn't, I couldn't afford it. I didn't have the money for it. Um, but I really, really, really wanted to take this class. And I don't even know how I found out about it, but there is a fund. I don't know if you guys know this or if it still exists. There are funds on campus, like the class of 1968 fund or whatever, where you can go and some like dude from the class of 68 will sit down and interview you for like five minutes and ask you why you want the money. And then they will give you money <laughs> to take the classes you want to take. I couldn't believe it. And I couldn't believe that I didn't find out about this until spring of my senior year. <laughs> so I guess the moral of that story is, you know, really, if there are things you want to do, the sky is kind of the limit. I mean, while you're here at school, there's so, this is an amazing institution and an amazing place to explore. Um, I would just strongly advise not to get too caught up. I mean, it depends. If you're pre-med, you sort of have to get caught up in the things you need to do to go to medical school, right? But in just about every other discipline, you have so much time to learn all that other stuff after you graduate or when you go to you know, uh, get your doctorate or your master's degree. I mean, there are certain things you have to do here. But there is still a lot of wiggle room there for you to take advantage of all the resources that are available on this campus. There's just so many amazing things um, that I wish I had known about. And that once, once I found out that that fund existed, I was like, what else could I have done, like asked for money for to go do some cool thing? Um, so I don't know if that answered your question, but uh, I, I wasn't at all worried about, like, I was a French major. That has nothing to do with programming and marketing. I wasn't at all worried about what I was going to major in. I think you really, um, and it sounds super cheesy, but I think you really just figure out what you happen to be passionate about at the time and really just give it your all, like put your heart into it. Um, because people will see that and they'll respect it. And you will learn so much about whatever that thing is that you can then apply to whatever the next thing is that you're going to do. And all of those things have definitely, you know, people don't really get why I was really into math and coding and French. But to me, it makes a lot of sense. They're all languages, right? I also love dancing. So I do a lot of salsa dancing and I took a bunch of ballroom classes. They're all languages. They're all like things where there are little bits of pieces that you learn and then you have to string them together in interesting and creative ways to create something that's actually visible or usable or interact you, that other people can interact with in some way. So in my head, it all made sense, but it didn't make sense until I'd been through enough of those experiences to sort of figure out how my own head worked. So I would just say, whatever it is that you think you're excited about, like don't worry about all the other stuff. Just follow that and do it and do it as the best that you can and learn as much about it as you can. And then you'll, the next thing will sort of make itself known to you. It sounds really cheesy, but uh, it worked for me. <laughs> so does that answer your question? Sort of? Uh, yeah. Yeah? OK. OK. Um, anything else? Social media questions? I love answering those. Those are easy. <laughs> yeah. So she's my friend, just for like, I don't know what she's going to say, but she's my friend, so. <laughs> Yeah. Was, it, was there anything you wish you would have done like in undergrad to, to have maybe bolstered just kind of being connected to people you went to school with or that connection earlier? Um, that is a really good question. Oh, so by the way, the other thing, the other sort of hat that I wear, so I run my, my, my marketing consulting firm, but I also 
Um, I'm the president of a, a sort of a big growing alumni organization called the Black Ivy Alumni League, which is basically um, a group of the group for black alumni from all eight of the Ivy League schools. So I took over running that group about six years ago. Um, and it's been sort of like a second business, actually, um, and a, just in a completely different context. And obviously, a lot of the marketing skills that I have um, are very useful in that context. Um, and as I learned things about you know, networking and relationship building, that was a really excellent platform to kind of experiment with them. Um, volunteering is, is awesome. I just think you have so many opportunities to take on leadership roles or create projects or create things as a volunteer that no one will let you do if they're paying you. Um, and I really leverage, so th these are not things I necessarily leveraged when I was here, but right after I graduated, I started volunteering. Um, I started volunteering for the Princeton Club of New York. Um, I uh, ran their young alumni committee first, um, and then I ran their community service committee. That was a little like social network that I ended up building when I was learning Pearl. Um, and then I started their career networking committee, um, and then I was on their board for a number of years. Um, so I'm happy to talk to anybody about that. But and then the work that I do for the Black Ivy Alumni League is all volunteer. Um, and everyone who's in that organization who produces all the events and all that stuff, it's all volunteers. So I think, I don't know looking back that I really just had the wherewithal to, to be thinking about those things because those were lessons that I just didn't learn until I was thrown into a situation where I was basically, somebody used this phrase and it's probably not that great, but I eat what I kill, right? Like, I go out and I'm the rainmaker and I'm finding all the clients that come into our business. So, um, and that's, you know, it's not necessarily the greatest business model. You don't want to just rely on the constant process of finding new business. But, and that's obviously shifting and changing, which is a whole other conversation. But I, I really do think that um, there's just a certain evolution that we each go through. Um, and for me, understanding really the value and the power of relationships didn't come until like 15 years after I graduated from college. So, and I don't know why it took that long, but it did. Had I known those things while I was here, um, I don't know, gosh, there's so, so many things I could have probably done, I don't know. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely wish that I had understood that while I was here and been able to look at my options and all that funding <laughs> that was available um, to do other things. But at the same time, I also, you know, I had to work, I had jobs. So that was also just a major priority for, for me here, which is having enough money to like survive while I was here. Um, I have to say, in, for many years, until I got that job at Morgan, um, this was like my wealthiest, <laughs> this is the wealthiest time of my life. Because you, you just have no responsibilities while you're here. So I was making not huge amounts of money, but I also didn't have a ton of things that I needed to spend it on. So until I got that job at Morgan Stanley, uh, this was the time when I was most comfortable financially. <laughs> Obviously things have changed since then, thank goodness. But, um, but yeah, but that was really my main focus while I was on campus is just studying and like earning the money I needed to, to kind of live here. But had I had those opportunities to think more about relationship building, I think I definitely would have taken advantage of that. Because now, you know, all the people that I graduated with or were a year behind me or a couple years ahead of me, they're like running things. They are. They're, they've started these amazing companies. There's a guy, um, if any of you incidentally are over 21, <laughs> a bunch of us are going out to Triumph after this. <laughs> and there's a guy who's coming there who started Predictive Networks, which is this huge company. And he runs the Tiger Venture Lab now here in, in Princeton. I mean, there's just some amazing people who we went to school with here. Um, and I, I definitely, I think I would have taken the opportunity to find more of those people. Um, I really loved being a French major, but I do wish uh, that I had taken a little more of an opportunity to explore the sciences while I was here. I think the most I did was take a couple of geology labs, which I really enjoyed. Um, but on the engineering side, on the physics side, I think there were some things that, and even on the computer programming side, I didn't take a computer programming class in my entire life until I signed up for one uh, spring of senior year and was really jazzed about it until I realized it met every day at 9.30. Yeah, that didn't last. So I dropped that. <laughs> What's that? Things have changed. Things, oh, have they? 
Yeah, yeah, I just, there was no way. I'm not a morning person, so there was no way I was making a 9.35 senior spring. Like, that wasn't going to happen. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I would have explored more of the sciences, and then I would have learned more about the people who were here. Probably some of the things I would have done differently. Anything else? Yeah? Uh, you talked about the importance of um, like sharing your idea and making connections if you're interested in starting your own business. Uh -huh. I was wondering if, uh, in addition to those things, if there are three things uh, that you could think of that a lot of people might overlook or that fly under the radar that really help you um, in your entrepreneurial career. It's a very precise question. Three. I get three. Well, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm sorry. I'm just kidding. Um, so two of them I kind of gave already. Um, I really mean it when I people give a lot of lip service to the power of relationships, but some things people give lip service to because they are really meaningful. Um, and I know that's one of those things that unfortunately is really hard to understand until you understand it. But here's a great example. I think I've, got, I've had a lot of clients in my business. The best ones, the most profitable ones, the ones that were the most fun to work with and that we did some of the best work with, all of those came through people I knew relationships. And they weren't my best friends. These were people who had, so I teach a lot, people who would come through my classes and I just had no idea that they were like a marketing executive at some Fortune 1000 company because they just didn't, sh they didn't share that information. They came to the class because they were interested in being an entrepreneur, but their day job was doing something, you know, for the man, <laughs> right? Like they were working at some huge company, which they enjoyed, but they were also thinking about being an entrepreneur, and so they were wearing that hat when they were in my class. But because they came through my class and I kept in touch with them, I ended up getting these amazing projects. Um, Columbia University came on as one of our clients this year. I got that client because in January, a Princeton woman who I served on a volunteer committee with invited me to come and speak at a conference to a bunch of colleges and universities from around the world, and I sat on the panel with this guy who now runs this department at Columbia. <laughs> That's how things happen. Um, I came down actually a couple of years ago and did another presentation on um, the like job search and social media. And I came across this really interesting statistic that um, I think it's 70% of the jobs that become open and get filled, get filled without a job posting. They get filled through the internal networks of the people who are doing the hiring. 70%. We think about that for a minute. They get filled through the networks of the people who are doing the hiring. And I can tell you, as the president of the Black Ivy Alumni League, it's one of the reasons why we, are, why we have the ability to build relationships with companies is because unfortunately, I mean, this gets into a whole other like philosophical conversation, but you know, there, are, there are a lot of disconnects in terms of finding diverse candidates among those networks. Um, and so it, it's, it's cost something like seven times the amount of money to fill a job with a diverse candidate because they just are not in the networks of the people who are doing the hiring. You think about that 70%, right? The other 30%, those jobs get posted, but then half of them are still filled with a candidate that is in the network of the people doing the hiring. It is all relationships. So like I said, every client that I've had that was good that we really loved, that was profitable, all came through just what seems like random connections with people that I met. The ink column that I got, um, I, they called me and said, hey, we, we want someone to write about internet marketing. I, I, didn't even, I didn't go out and ask for that. They called me up. I was on the bus <laughs> going oh to the Upper East Side, and they called me on my cell phone. I'm like, who is this? Because I usually don't answer for a number that I don't recognize. This day, I decided to answer it. This would never happen now, by the way, because I don't even use my voicemail on my cell phone anymore, but that's another. So I answered the phone, and it was, oh, she, oh yeah, I'm so-and-so from Inc. Magazine. You know, <laughs> We're looking for someone to write about internet marketing. I'm like, is this a joke? The way that happened is because at that point, I had been uh, speaking at all these events around the city, I spoke for the Department of Small Business Services, which is you know part of the uh, Small Business Administration. Um, I did a ton of class. I did all their internet marketing and website classes for like six years. Um, I spoke for all of the sort of 
incubators, entrepreneurial incubators that were funded uh, by the government to help businesses get started and prosper in New York City. Everybody knew me. So what happened was when she was calling around to ask for suggestions for people to write, she kept hearing my name from all these different people who had either been to my classes or hired me to speak. And most of that stuff I was doing for free. I was speaking at most of those events for free. The city paid me, um, but all the other things I did for free. And it was just the repetition of hearing my name. And then I ended up on a panel with another editor, a journalist and editor from Black Enterprise. I ended up on a panel with her. I thought she was cool. She had just moved to the city. I was really nice to her because she had just moved to town. And I was like, oh yeah, I'll just let me know if you want someone to show you around. And we just, we had a connection. And so the editor that ended up hiring me at Inc. Um, said that when she heard from this other journalist that I was the person to go to, she was done. Like she didn't even call anybody else. That's the way stuff happens. And I don't know why people don't talk about that more. I think people just want you to believe that like, oh yeah, I went out and I got this column for Inc. Magazine. That's not how it happens. <laughs> so, I mean, I think it's important to go out and be aggressive and ask for things. But people are gonna do their research. They're gonna do their homework. They're gonna ask other people about you. Um, and so those relationships and those contacts and connections really matter. Um, and you, so you don't wanna do things that are fake, but you, you wanna be authentic in who you connect with and reach out to, um, people you actually like, admire, um, but you do want to get yourself out there. So um, I would say, again, the relationships, um, strategic partnerships, huge. Again, I don't know why people don't talk about this, but uh, like I said, every major company, they're not going out and getting customers one at a time for like the first 15 years they're in business. To, to really tip, you have to, the, the key is essentially that acquisition cost. The cost of acquiring a new customer has to be low enough. If you're gonna do a huge volume-based business, the cost of acquiring that new customer has to be low enough that you can make a huge profit on whatever it is that you're charging. If it costs too much for you to find that customer, and this is one of the reasons why Groupon and a lot of these sort of daily deal sites are having some problems, because it costs too, they have teams of salespeople going out and calling individual businesses. That is extremely expensive for them to do. So it's one of the reasons why these companies are having trouble is because the cost of acquisition is way too high. So I can't talk enough about the power of strategic partners. Um, and if there was a third thing, yeah, that the third thing is also kind of easy for me because I made the mistake of Again, thinking I had to do everything by myself. So yeah, I can program and I can do a little bit of design and I have all these marketing skills. But if you wanna build a business and not just another job for yourself, your job is to hire the people and find the team and create the value and then to go out and, I mean, at a certain point, you're probably gonna be doing a lot of the sales and the acquisition of uh, all the business development but at some point, that also has to get outsourced or turned over or delegated to somebody else. So the mistake that I made in the beginning of trying to build websites for $500, if I had, if I had realized early enough that I couldn't afford to hire people at those prices, um, I wouldn't have made that mistake. I wouldn't have spent so long trying to do these things at such ridiculous rates. Um, the other thing that was really hard for me in that, uh, along those lines was, uh, just bringing on project managers to actually interface and account managers to interface with my clients and interface with the team. I really felt like that was something I couldn't give up if I wanted to have a quality business and deliver a quality service. But you know what I found out? I suck at that. I'm the worst person to do that job. I have people on my team now who are a million times better at managing clients than I am. But I thought it needed to be me if I was going to do this properly until a friend sort of kicked me in the butt one day and was like, you know what? If you continue spending all your time managing those client relationships, you will never grow this business. And it took someone just being really tough and very honest with me to tell me I was being really stupid because that, that work requires so much time. You really need to spend the time to manage those relationships properly. I mean, I think that's true in most businesses. So um, just making sure that you think from day one when you get that first project or that first client, hire somebody else to manage it. Don't completely take yourself out, out of it. Be still a part of the process. But if you can, hire somebody else to manage it because you will start to learn very early the skills you'll need to then grow that company and hire more people and hire other. Because hiring is a whole, that's a whole learning curve in and of itself. Just 
learning how to find and hire and manage and motivate and you know, treat people the way that they would like to be treated to be excited about working with you. That's a whole learning curve by itself. I hate hiring people, actually. It's one of the worst parts of what I do. But I love it when I find gr great people at the end of that process. That I love, and I love working with them. But the hiring process is a nightmare. So those are the three things I would say. The strategic partnerships, uh, making sure you build those relationships and talk to lots of people, have lots of people in your network, um, and uh, learning how to delegate and knowing that you have to delegate, that it's not something you wait to do. You try to do it from day one so you can set the business up properly from the beginning. Yeah. Blogging experience. Like, how do you, like, I feel like, like, most people, when they look at a blog, they want to be, like, educated, but at the same time, you have to think about, like, social media, like, getting followers and having yeah. Well, I actually have an answer, like a really specific answer, because I write about that a lot. Um, I have a handout here that, honestly, I usually give to my students who come to take my internet marketing classes, but it does have a link written on it to my blog, as well as a link to the archive of all my articles. So I definitely invite you to grab one of these, because you can go read what I've actually written about that. I write about it a lot. Um, but the quick answer is, People really do think uh, when they're embarking on a blog most of the time that it's all about writing, that you're going to spend all your time thinking about topics and content and writing and rewriting and crafting it. Um, that is probably 40 to 50 percent, the writing part of what you really need to be doing. If you want your blog to be um, highly trafficked, especially if you're trying to create a blog that you intend to be a revenue generator, so you want to build tons and tons and tons of traffic and then get your own advertisers and sponsors, that is probably then 20% of what you're responsible for doing is the writing. Um, so you really do need to think about how you're going to, so when, once you write it, people have to know it's there, right? And everybody is super busy. So even if they love your writing and love your content, they are not going to remember to go and check. I mean, how many blogs do you remember to go and check? on a daily or weekly or monthly basis. You just don't, you read what's there in front of you because it's easy and there are enough people who are gonna make the effort to be in front of you that you usually don't have to go out and find um, a, lot of the other, a lot of the other stuff. So you really have to make sure that you're doing the work to make your blog visible. It's the same as building a business. You have to do the work to market that business and make the business visible so that when people are ready to buy your services or your products, they'll remember you. It's the same thing with your blog. So you know, you're using email marketing, right? You're, you're building up a list of people who are interested. FeedBurner is a great tool. It's free. It's run by Google, and it lets you, people subscribe to your blog. So you can email them. It will email them automatically for you every time you, you make a new post. Highly recommend FeedBurner. Um, using Twitter, using the Tweet This widget, um, or putting, like I did, a little link at the bottom saying, tweet this article if you like it. Um, uh, I mean, you can just sort of look at my blog and look at all the techniques that I've used. They're all kind of right there. Um, getting people to connect with you on LinkedIn. Now, LinkedIn's a little tricky because you don't want to, I get a lot of people who email me on LinkedIn every time they post something, and I'm this close to disconnecting with them. It's annoying. I'm not on LinkedIn so that you can use my LinkedIn account as another email mailing list. If I wanted to be on your mailing list, I would join your mailing list. So, you know, you have to be kind of careful with LinkedIn. Um, but it is another resource to let people know about what you're doing. It, doing. Um, TigerNet, again, you don't want to email people every time you post, but maybe every couple of months you let people know, hey, I just wrote these five posts, and try to do it in a way that's actually thought-provoking and, and uh, in the context of discussion, not just in self-promotion, because people can see right through that. Um, so yeah, there are tons of ways, and I guess the specific answer to your question is, it's going to, the marketing part and the visibility part is going to be somewhere between, it's going to be around 50% of your job. It's a lot. Is that kind of what you were thinking, or is that? Um, yeah. Oh, good. Kind of, okay. I don't know, it's kind of like a norm. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a different language. The marketing language? It is, but hopefully it's fun. I mean, it depends on why you're writing. You know, for me, writing was about, it's the same as what I'm doing now in terms of speaking. It's the same when I do my classes. The information that I think I have to share, I think is important for a lot of people. And I, I don't think that there are that many people who do what I do 
who talk about it the same way that I talk about it. Um, because I feel like I come from a place where I knew nothing, I zero, I knew nothing. And so the struggle that I kind of went through to learn all of these things and make tons of mistakes and fail a lot and get fired and all this crazy stuff, um, I feel like that gives me a unique perspective and the ability to kind of help people bridge that gap. So when I write, I feel like the whole point of my writing is to help people and get that information out so that people actually can benefit from it and use it and leverage it. Um, and I think that there's a definitely a feedback cycle there. You know, so someone uh, tweets, oh, hey, I just read your Inc. articles. I love them. They've helped me so much. I want to know which ones. Which one did you read? How did it help you? Why? What are you doing? What industry are you in? What's your business? You know, is there some way that we can be strategic partners, right? Like, <laughs> there's, you know, the, the, the feedback and the way that people are interacting with the content and using it is part of the joy for me. So the marketing part is just part of that experience. So I don't know what you're writing about, but I would definitely, you know, think about changing your perspective on what the marketing is and why you're doing it. If you're writing something and you feel like what you're writing is important, then the people that get to read it, nobody reads it, half of what you're doing is sort of wasted. Right? You get the catharsis of writing it, but if you're not actually getting the word out there, it's sort of like, what's the point? Um, and that marketing experience, it shouldn't be about self-promotion. It should be about actually engaging and connecting with people and giving them the opportunity to read your stuff and learn from what it is, whatever it is you have to say. You know what I mean? Hopefully that helps. Any other questions? No? All right, I think I've <laughs> sort of talked enough. So it was nice to meet you guys. You're welcome.